Good evening, LifeBridge. Can you believe that in about three, four days, I think it is, that we're going to be now leaving the year 2020 and entering into a new year, 2021. And something that is always, I think, a good suggestion to do is to take a look back at the past year and learn some things that will help us as we move forward into the new year. It's, it's uh, hindsight is 2020, they say. And so that would be a good thing to do, especially being the year 2020 as we look forward into 2021. So uh, today we're going to be looking at some of the things that we can learn to help us move forward in our lives uh, in this new year coming up. Now, while visiting a friend's farm in Saskatoon a number of years ago, a, a huge, beautiful oak falling in the back pasture of his place caught my eye. Amazed at the size of the size of this mighty tree on its side, I walked up and down that huge oak, wondering why it fell, even though there were still healthy green leaves budding. The friend I was with explained that even though the tree was big, its, its root system was small. It, it didn't have good roots, and it fell when the soil got drenched in the last rainstorm. So the combination of shallow roots, heavy rains, and strong winds had caused this tree to fall over. I think that's a good picture of how many people feel about what happened to them in 2020. Way back a year before that, in 2019, they were hanging on, possibly even feeling like they were getting rooted in life. You know, it's a job or a new job or even their existing job and a new promotion or a relationship or school uh, was just beginning for them, maybe in a university education or, or in a sports team in a university or just starting to maybe get out of debt or going on that amazing trip that, that had been planned for forever or going on that missions project or getting back in shape or finally working on mental health or anxiety, finally getting that under control. I mean, things looked really good and healthy and exciting, or at least we're going in that direction. Whatever taking root meant in 2019, however, was suddenly uprooted in 2020. It was a challenging year to say the least. The global pandemic, masks, shutdown, school closures, masks, restaurants closing down, people losing jobs, churches pausing, family challenges. And by the way, did I mention masks? I mean, that's just a small list. Now, whatever you think about it, one thing is certain, 2020 was derailed for millions, in fact, possibly billions of people worldwide. We were now living a movie plot, the great pandemic. But as they say, hindsight is 2020. What if at the start of 2019, we could have known what we know now? What can we learn from the past year so that no matter what storm that we face in the future, in the new year and the years following that, we're gonna be able to stand strong? What can we do today that will make certain that we have a root system so deep we'll not only uh, withstand the winds and the rains and the storms that'll come, and believe me, there will be more storms, whether they come as pandemics or other things, that'll not only keep us standing, but growing and thriving as well. The good news is that even if you have felt like you were punched in the mouth by 2020, or that your life was ripped apart because of a global pandemic, or even if it wasn't that dramatic, but you have been made to feel unsettled this past year, that you don't ever have to be in that position again. In fact, the great news is that moving forward, you can be among those whose feet are planted and whose root systems uh, grow, uh, grow strong and deep and even thrive during any difficult year, even in a pandemic. Well, let's take a look at uh, Psalm chapter 1, we're going to be looking at all six verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the reading of God's word. So, just what does this psalm have to teach us about discovering a true and a lasting joy and about being grounded in 2021? Well, first of all, this psalm tells us that it starts with choosing the right counsel. The first verse is, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now, deep down, all of us want to be, live a, a full and a satisfying life, uh, a life of joy and peace and 
contentment and, and satisfaction. So I, I don't think that desire for that type of life is the issue here. But as we learned in 2020, a consistent life of joy and peace and contentment and satisfaction has been downright elusive uh, at the very least for a lot of people and, and completely non-existent at the worst for others. So that's why I think it's great news to find somebody like, for example, the Apostle Paul, who tells us in Philippians 4 that he has discovered the secret of being content and through that a life of joy. And more to the point, wants to share his experience with the rest of us. And if one person has learned the secret and was willing to share it with others, as Paul did, that means that others can learn the secret too. Which means then that it's really not a secret. It's instead a piece of really, really good news that we just didn't know before. It's like saying that the secret to a great conversation and fellowship is a grande non-fat Americano misto coffee with an added shot of espresso. Ah, glorious. Now, if you didn't know that fact, it may at first sound like it was a secret being kept from you, from the non-initiate. But truth be told, it's it's a bit of great news and a wonderful tip that the rest of us coffee drinkers wish to share with the whole world. You're welcome. Now, if you don't like coffee, uh, I'm very sad for you. But trust me when I say that the sweet nectar of the coffee bean helps every conversation go well, even when they don't. Now, just like Paul, Jesus wants to share this secret, not a secret, about knowing real joy as well. He said this in John 15, I have spoken these things to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be made full. So, I think it's a good question to ask just what is this true joy and contentment that Jesus and Paul want to share with you and me? Does it mean that once we come to Jesus, all of our problems go away? They just disappear. Is that how we become happy? Or maybe it's that we get everything we ever wanted. That's how we become contented and satisfied. I took a look at Webster's Dictionary and Webster's Dictionary defines happiness as a pleasurable or satisfying experience. Then if you go and ask people to define happiness themselves, most people would say something similar. They would say something like happiness is feeling good and and having fun. Now, if that were true, then it would follow that the greater number of fun experiences that we have, the happier we become. So is that how this happy joy thing works? Well, in light of that question, I took a look at a group of people who probably should be the happiest, most contented and joy-filled, satisfied people on earth, the baby boomers. You know, as I looked at their life choices, I found it very, very interesting to learn that the earning power of the baby boomers increased dramatically over that of any previous generation in history. They have more money, more leisure time, more access to sports, travel, and entertainment than any society has ever known. And yet baby boomers are experiencing a tenfold increase in depression over the previous generations. Listen, if the attainment of stuff and fun experiences did it for us, then Canada should be like Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. But it's not. So why is that? Well, when we go back to Psalm 1, we see that the blessed man is described by where he gets his counsel from. That's a good starting point. Actually, uh, more, to, more specifically, who he avoids getting counsel from. In other words, we're not to get our advice from those who try to give us a different message than what God wants us to hear. And there are so many messages around us, aren't there? Messages that begin to sound really good if we're not rooted in God's word. I'll give you an example. Who here has ever heard the uh, advice, you know what, uh, just follow your heart. Your heart will never steer you wrong. The problem is, is that your heart won't lead you right. It just won't. Jeremiah said this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, if that's true, and by the way it is, then how can we trust our own heart to be able to follow uh, in any matter, let alone somebody else's? Yet this is one of the messages that so many of us, even here in the church, has swallowed and accepted as fact. Because we hear it, I think, enough. But when we buy into that way of thinking, we're actually declaring our independence from God. We're telling Him that we're okay to trust our own hearts. Don't need you. The problem, though, is that for those who buy into that, into the world's way of thinking, they, they keep finding that true joy and real contentment and satisfaction is impossible to hold on to for very long. 
Granted, at times this way of life appears to be the way of success, acceptance, and prosperity. At first glance, the baby boomers who, have, who seem to have arrived at the pinnacle of cultural success have achieved that. But then why the huge increase in depression? However, this psalm helps us to see things in an ultimate perspective. The prosperity of the wicked is short-lived, more like chaff or dust that gets blown away by the wind. So, because the blessed man or woman is able to recognize the futility of the world's wisdom and its values, they will instead ground themselves in the deep, rich soil of God's word. Moving on, we come to what I suggest is probably the key verse in, in, the, in this whole passage. It's verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in uh, his law he meditates day and night. We are here instructed, church, to delight and meditate on the law or on the Word of God. You know, when Debbie first came down the aisle on our wedding day, people commented about how my eyes just lit up with delight when seeing her come down towards me in that wedding dress. She looked really good. As I delighted in her radiance, you could say I also meditated. No, I didn't stand there with a blank look on my face and I didn't hum or anything like that. In other words, I, I thought about our future together, and I had a deep desire to know her intimately. You see, delight is a natural response of the heart to the beauty and the value of something, or in the case of Deb and I, someone. And in the case of the psalmist, there's a delight to God's word, a deep desire to know the word intimately. Ask yourself whether or not that would describe you. When God's word is read by you or, or, or somebody else, does that brighten up your day? So much so that you just can't wait to get up in the morning to read it yourself. So much so that you just can't help but meditate on it. You know, thinking about it and your future life with Jesus. Listen to this statistic. Do you realize that the average family has a television on for over seven and a half hours a day? That's the average family, which means that some have it on for 10, maybe 12 hours a day. We, meanwhile, most of the church in North America don't even spend more than 10 minutes a day in God's Word. Maybe it maybe might be stretched to 40 minutes on Sundays because of, it, of their church attendance. Now, listen, I'm not trying to say this to guilt us. I'm, I'm telling you this to just to get us to think. Now, a part of growing a delight in God's law requires meditation because it's through meditation where we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, as Paul talks about in Romans 12. Listen, if our minds aren't changed, we'll keep on thinking like those baby boomers, and we already know how that worked out for them. I delighted, and I still delight in Debbie because my mind was changed, my, my way of thinking was transformed when I met her in 1988. I thought up to that point that my life revolved around me alone, and I was quite happy to live in that delusion. But then I saw her, and my mind was changed. My thinking was transformed, so much so that I began to believe that I couldn't live without her. Now, I don't have to get up every morning and look at my notes to remind myself that, oh yeah, I'm married to her. I keep forgetting, silly me. Yeah, I, I know I'm married to her, which is why, uh, why I meditate on her. What I mean by that is that all my planning and my decisions include her. I think about what to buy her on her birthday, how to provide for the home, how to raise our kids together, how to apologize for saying that stupid thing I said. I think about us and how we will journey into our old age together. Because I delight in her, I meditate or think and continue to plan life with her. You know what, that should be the same with us. Even more so when it comes to delighting in God's word and in spending time with the word, Jesus. However, I think we can still all agree that our lives are unbelievably distracted, aren't they? We're experts at multitasking, we're surfing the net and skimming the pages of the book. But it, it, it's harder than ever, I think, to meditate on God's Word with all the white noise and the busyness of life that we live in. But to grow and thrive as a disciple of Jesus, we must. We must. But how? Well, if possible, Find a consistent time, place, and plan. That's what I do. I, I get up early in the morning, sometimes at 5.30 in the morning, and I'll, and I'll go find a spot before everybody else is up so I can have some quiet time and I can focus and concentrate. And I pick up the Word of God and I read it slowly and I read it carefully and I read it prayerfully. 
What I do is I read with a pen in hand and, and a journal on my lap. I'll often memorize texts that I read and, and, I, and I'll read with other people and I'll talk about what I see and, and I'll share it with other people and it gets ingrained in my mind. What I'd suggest you do is maybe some of those things, but certainly study a book of the Bible with a good commentary. Or, and in fact, pray about a plan for biblical meditation this year. And as you meditate in the light for God's, and, and God's word grows in your heart, what you're going to discover is you joyfully will get grounded with roots that begin to go deep, deep, deep. In other words, when you get grounded, you become the tree and not the chaff. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers, if you remember in verse 3. The picture we have here in this psalm, in this, and specifically in this verse, verse 3, is of a continual flowing of refreshing water that gives the tree life. The water flows 24-7 and the tree is able to suck up all it requires to live. And not only to live, but to thrive and to produce fruit. What, though, hangs heavy in my heart is that I know people who will leave after their 45-minute fix of God's Word on Sunday or watching this video, and they'll be so excited about living for Jesus, but within hours, uh, maybe it's that evening or the next morning, they're going to find themselves anxious again, or they'll find themselves back into that angry habit like they were before that Sunday, or they'll be intoxicated or high, or, or they'll be back into pornography or they'll be fighting with their spouse or their kids or their parents again. And yet they were so sure that those things were conquered after getting excited at church on Sunday. And, and, and they want to change, but they don't. Why is that? Here's why, church. You can't be watered 45 minutes each week and expect to be strengthened. There must be a continual watering. A tree without uh, water will die. That is why we need to get involved in hanging out with God's people on Sundays and in reading God's word for ourselves and gathering with one or two others in triads or in groups like life groups through the week who are actively growing in relationship with Jesus. And that'll help you get grounded, church. The blessed man is grounded in that deep, rich earth of God's word. And as a result, is not only unmoved by the counsel and the advice of the wicked, but is growing and thriving. They evidence the picture of a mighty oak that shows strength and life. Now, in contrast, instead of the strength and the life of a mighty oak tree, the wicked are like chaff. Now, chaff, by the way, is the husk around wheat kernels. Now, if you've never seen chaff, it's similar to the brown skin around a peanut. In other words, it's like nothing. And, and my breath could simply blow it away, just, and it's gone. That's why in verse 5 we see that the wicked can't stand before God in the judgment, where it says, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked is anyone who hasn't accepted God's offer of salvation and made peace between God and themselves, haven't found that shalom between God and themselves. In other words, anyone who isn't for God and submits to his law is against God and is then counted as wicked, which we all were before we gave our lives to Jesus. So just imagine now standing before God who is perfect and holy and you're going to be judged. I think we don't think about that often enough. And in the world, that thought is made light of. You know, I'll just deal with the big guy in the sky when the time comes. Listen, you can deal with God as easily as you can deal with standing before a nuclear bomb as it goes off. And to top it all off, even what we think is good enough is only good enough to get us into the front door of hell. Never have it. That's because even what we think is righteous or good enough is just a bunch of filthy rags to God. In other words, the best we've ever done is just chaff. So imagine standing before God and all you have to show for your life is the very best and it's chaff. You have nothing substantial to hold on to. You're going to be blown away and not in the good sense. Bottom line is that in the end, the wicked will not be able to stand before God no matter how confident they are today. So instead, get grounded and be the tree. Don't be the chaff. Well, it goes on to say, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, what's the congregation of the righteous? Congregation of the righteous is us in heaven with God. There's going to be a day when we're going to need to be held accountable, all of us. 
And if all you have to show is the chaff that we talked about already, you'll not be able to spend time with God and his righteous ones. So again, be the tree. Don't be the chaff. In fact, the best New Year's resolution anyone could make leaving 2020 and heading into 2021 is to be the tree, not the chaff. Now, finally, we see in this verse 6 that the blessed man is righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, what I see in this verse especially, but really all six verses, is that this passage is all about Jesus. Now, you might be asking right now, you know, listen, Pastor, really? I don't see the name of Jesus here. Are you trying to pull a fast one? I've read it over a couple of times. I still don't see Jesus. Well, let me tell you right off the bat, I'll lay it on the table for you. No, I'm not trying to trick you, and I'm not doing the old bait and switch. Let me tell you why and just how this psalm leads us to Jesus. It's in the word righteous. The word righteous in verse 6 presses us forward to Jesus Christ as our righteousness. Now, since we see in this verse that only the righteous will survive the judgment in the end, we should then be asking an important question. We kind of touched on it earlier, but who is righteous? Well, the righteous are those people like you and me who know for a fact that we're not righteous and are guilty before a holy God, but because of Jesus, somehow we're now righteous. So how in the world could that be? How can a holy and a righteous God not count the sin in my life? How can the, he not require perfect righteousness from me for his perfect heaven? Well, the answer is that God does count the sin in my life and in your life, and he does require perfect righteousness. Now, that doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? But that is why this psalm leads us to Jesus, who was wounded for our rebellious acts and crushed for our sins. He was punished so that we could have peace and we received healing from his wounds. So the point is this, that God did count our sin and he punished it in Christ. He did require righteousness and he made it happen in Jesus. And that blows my mind in the good way. That even with all of our imperfections and failings and shortcomings and repeated failures, we can still be counted as one of the righteous ones because of Christ's righteousness. And then notice the second part of verse 6 where he says, The way of the wicked will perish. What that tells us is that even though right now it feels like a fight to keep from the way of the world, one day Jesus will eliminate that fight from our lives. That way will perish. And what a day that's going to be. But we do still live in the here and the now. That day still has not come. Which means then that we need to be continually rooted in Christ by immersing ourselves in his word. Because when you do, it'll drive your roots deeper and deeper into his good, life-giving soil and his living waters. Now, as I look back at last year, I'll admit that I'm excited for 2020 to be over. And in many ways, I'm ready for things to just get back to normal. But as I was preparing this message and thinking about getting grounded more than ever before, I kept thinking that I really don't believe that God wants things to get back to normal for you and me anyways. I believe that God wants instead to do a new thing in your life and in my life and in LifeBridge in 2021. Now, for many people, normal is depression and anxiety or normal is brokenness. Normal is, is, uh, is not growing your roots deeper and deeper. Normal is just more of the same. Uh, could be even apathy. I don't know about you, but I don't want more of the same. I don't want to be apathetic to God. I want God to do something new in me and through me. I want to be grounded so that I can grow and thrive in my relationship with God this year like no other year before. But before God can do something new through me, I must allow him to do something new in me. Now, Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. You know what? Our God is all about taking the old and doing something new. Listen, church, as we start 2021, I believe God wants to do something new at LifeBridge and new in yours and my life. But the question remains, will we let him? Listen, Jesus invites all who are tired of trying to make it on their own to come to him. And he invites you to come to the well that never runs dry and to drink of the living water and never thirst again, to be grounded in him in 2021. Because when we come to Jesus and when we root our lives in him, we'll find that he will satisfy all of our deepest, deepest needs and deepest longings. And if you don't, and, and you don't have to wait to get it all figured out before you do. You don't have to get all cleaned up and 
dress just right for him to accept you. You see, he wants you to come as you are. So in other words, bring all your failures and your messes and your addictions and your problems and your challenges and all your anxieties and your cares and, your, and even your rage, all of your questions and your doubts and your fears, and just lay them down at the foot of the cross because Jesus is waiting there with open arms to set you free and to do a new thing in you. And whoever believes in him will live forever. And that is a lot longer than even how 2020 felt. And when you root your life in Jesus, you're going to find that the power of sin, death, and Satan will finally, finally be defeated. And one day, even the presence of sin will no longer be in our face. It'll be gone forever. So this year, let me encourage you to pursue Jesus passionately. Love people recklessly. Engage in making disciples with a purpose like never before. Make 2021 the year where you commit to be in the tree and never again be in the chaff and embrace the new thing that Jesus wants to do in you and through you. Happy New Year. God bless, and you are loved.